you know, Warren Buffett is you got to earn it. Uh -huh. You're not getting in here unless you do something that really stands out. And uh, that's creative. And that's what I got from the, the rejection. So in 2007, I wrote this case study, got it accepted. I had an academic journal. Then I had this epiphany that, hey, what if I were to take this, this case study and send it to Warren Buffett and try and get invited again? Uh, why not? You know, and so I sent it to him and within 10 days, there was a letter in my mailbox, uh, from Warren Buffett and thanking me for writing such a nice case study about him. And he invited me to Omaha that year. That was in 2009. As a matter of fact, we came up that same weekend that he bought BNSF. Uh -huh. So all these, uh, photographers and cameras were following him around all day, following us. But he didn't want to have anything to do with them. He wanted to focus on us because Warren Buffett loves teaching. Welcome to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest subject of all, money. How to make it, save it, keep it. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question. What it means to live a rich life beyond money. My guests share their practices, principles, and evergreen wisdom. I'm your host, Bogumil Baranowski, author, TEDx speaker, investor, and a founding partner of Seacard Associates, a boutique investment firm founded in New York City. Join me on this quest to unearth the wisdom of the ages. Welcome, esteemed listeners. Thank you so much for reaching out with your emails and messages. Your thoughts mean the world to me, and I will be responding shortly. Now, hold on to your seats because June has been an absolute whirlwind of recording brilliance. I've had the honor of hosting an array of incredibly insightful guests. And guess what? To make sure you don't have to wait too long, I'm toying with the idea of a double treat, two episodes per week for a short burst. Keep your eyes peeled for this bounty of knowledge. If you're curious to hear more, don't forget to subscribe to my Substack. It's a treasure trove of articles, podcast episodes, and exclusive bonus content. A simple search with my name and you're in. Now, a heartfelt thank you for the wave of appreciation for my recent book, Crisis Investing. It's packed with a hundred pandemic era essays that are both a reflection of the times and timeless in their wisdom. The book's warm reception has led it to grace the top position in Amazon's new releases. If you haven't yet indulged, I cordially invite you to explore its pages. And if it speaks to you, do consider leaving a cherished review on Amazon and Goodreads. Now with that, let's get started with our episode. My guest today is Professor Todd Finkel. I had the pleasure of hearing Professor Finkel speak in Omaha earlier this year, and he was kind enough to join me for today's discussion. It was a real joy to have him on the show, and I learned a lot more about our shirt hero Warren Buffett. Todd Finkel, PhD, is the Piggott Professor of Entrepreneurship at Gonzaga University. He's also an investor, entrepreneur, speaker, and consultant. His research interests include entrepreneurship, famous entrepreneurs, and the business methods and career of Warren Buffett. His most recent book, published by Columbia University Press, is Warren Buffett, Investor and Entrepreneur. Todd won an award, bronze medal, for the best business biography from the Axiom Business Books Awards. Dr. Finkel is a native of Omaha, having graduated from Omaha Central High School. He earned his undergraduate and doctoral degrees from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and an MBA from the University of Wisconsin-Medicine. We talk about Dr. Finkel's journey. We discuss Dr. Finkel's riveting book, Warren Buffett, Investor and Entrepreneur, exploring how it came into existence and the unique insights it provides on Buffett's entrepreneurial ventures. We dove into Dr. Finkel's passion for teaching. We unraveled a captivating parallel between young Buffett scavenging for discarded racetrack tickets and his early investment strategies. We unpacked the idea that Berkshire's huge success did not stem from a master plan, but rather from consistently showing up for opportunities that came Buffett's way. We explored Dr. Finkel's perspective on the entrepreneurial 
we explored Dr. Finkel's perspective on the entrepreneurial hunger and how it's an innate trait that cannot be taught. We reflected on the resilience that Buffett displayed over the many years and crises that he faced. We talk about the importance of surrounding oneself with smarter individuals than you are, something that Buffett talks about. We discussed the human aspect of entrepreneurship and being responsible for shareholders and employees. We delve into the serendipitous nature of how Buffett discovers investment ideas. We dissect some of Buffett's notable mistakes. We delve into Buffett's distinct philosophy regarding inheritance, philanthropy, examining his views. Finally, we end the conversation discussing Dr. Finkel's personal definition of success. Please help me welcome Professor Todd Finkel. Well, hello, Todd. It's nice to see you. Welcome to the show. Hello, sir. Uh Bogomil, thanks for having me on the show. I, uh, I've i been looking forward to this, and I've listened to uh, some of your other programs, and uh, I think what you're doing is great. I think it's extremely entrepreneurial. Uh, you're an entrepreneur, as you well know. Thank you. Uh, and I've always had a lot of respect for entrepreneurs. It's not easy being an entrepreneur. Well, it's my curiosity. I enjoy those conversations because I get to spend an hour with really interesting people, including yourself, and you wrote a wonderful book, and I told you how much I enjoyed it. And I actually listened to your panel discussion with Adam Mead in Omaha this year. So I got the preview of uh, life taught in action, and it was very enjoyable. And I took a lot of notes from the book, and you know that I have a lot of questions. So let's let's get started. And right. I, I love starting those conversations from the beginning, and I like to ask my guests about their childhood and upbringing, and you share a lot of it in the book, but maybe you can share more with the audience and how you think that time influenced specifically your relationship with money and then led you to the career path that you're on today. Um, before I get going on that, I just quickly want to thank a couple people uh, that helped me with the book. I think writing a book for all of you, you people that want to write a book someday, is a, a very entrepreneurial process in itself. And what happened with me was is that I had a lot of people that helped me. You can't know everything. So I have a big network. And whenever I contacted somebody and I needed help on something, they always said, yes, I'll be there for you, Todd. So the, the, the point there, the lesson there is don't be afraid to ask people for help. Because 9.9 .9 times out of 10, they'll probably say yes. That's true. But, um, but I had, you know, some, a couple of people that really helped me out a lot. Charles Fishkin, who's a, a childhood friend I, since he was, and, and he really helped me throughout the whole process. He's written a couple of books on risk and, uh, uh Matt Koffler, who's a CFA. Uh, really helped me out a lot with the evaluation, the behavioral finance aspect uh, of the book. Um, and he's just been marvelous. He's helped me out so much. And finally, I wanted to thank my wife. She'll like me for doing this <laughs> because I, I, I worked so hard on this book for so long. Um, she really understands what went in to writing this book and, uh, you know, three, three to four o'clock in the morning, many, many nights. And it, it was 14 years, but the first nine years were more so, um, going and visiting him with my students and writing articles about him and getting to know him, uh, from that viewpoint. And then finally, I had so much material on Buffett. I just finally said, Hey, I'm going to write a book, Buffett. All my friends thought I was nuts. And, uh, uh, but I can get to that later. Just because people tell you you're nuts about something, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be unsuccessful. You know, you, you just, you have to go with your gut on That's these right. things. So, uh, anyway, so thanks for letting me, uh, thank them because I haven't done that. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned it because uh, I, I wrote a few books myself and I, I can tell what a big project it is. So reading your book, I read it not as just a reader, but also as somebody that wrote books and writes regularly. And I know how much time and effort goes into looking up all the stories and details and fact checking and then delivering the whole 
narrative in a way that's easy to follow, entertaining, and educational too. Oh yeah, so, and yeah! Congratulations on your book. Oh, thank you. Know, you. <laughs> I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to get it. I just thank saw the uh, LinkedIn post about it. So thank um, you. So you, you above anybody would know <laughs> about writing a book. Uh, but you know, I learned so much from from writing this book. It really has transformed my life. Uh, not only financially, I think I, I'm doing much better financially mm -hmm. uh, from what I've learned, especially on the behavioral biases, valuation. But, you know, just on a personal level, you know, and, and learning about the things that, but kind of his life lesson, uh, and that's really uh, affected me significantly. And a lot of the times if there's a decision that I need to make, I'll think, oh, what would Warren Buffett do, <laughs> you know, and um, he, he's a role model for me, you know, and he says, surround yourself with people that are better than you. And he's in my circle of five. So, uh, but back to, uh, you know, my childhood is a little bit different. Um, I grew up in Omaha, which is where Warren Buffett grew up. And, uh, uh I went to high school with his son, uh, Peter used to eat lunch with him in the cafeteria. Uh, every day, these guys that I hung around with were all older than me, uh, and they were all really bright guys. And Pete was more the artistic type. He uh, was into photography, and he was into music, uh, wore a baseball cap, and ripped jeans to school. Uh, very, very nice guy, very humble, very similar to his father. Um, and uh, was on the yearbook staff, uh, the photographer on the yearbook staff and uh and one of the guys we actually ate lunch with every day uh, is a ceo has been a ceo of two uh, uh public companies out in silicon valley so it was uh an amazing group of kids that i that i hung around with and what was special about our high school was it's called omaha central high school and warren has thanked me for, uh, you know, some of these people that have come out of Omaha Central, um, their math department there is just incredible. And our math team would consistently come in the top three in the country wow. uh, when I was there. Um, so, and that guy that ended up going out to Silicon Valley and run to uh, public companies, he was just a genius. He was incredible. But um, yeah, so I had... Four brothers growing up, they all became entrepreneurs. My father was an entrepreneur. He had a, uh, a partnership in a bar, uh, and uh, his father died real young. And before his father died, he gave him a loan to buy a bar, and he brought in a partner. And um, I was in downtown Omaha, and then he, he eventually moved it out west, and uh, uh, we... When it came to money, that was an issue in our family because our family was so, you know, we had five boys, five big boys who uh, uh, used to fight all the time, you know, when you have all those boys in a 1,500 square foot high house. And uh, my mother was not a good money manager. Um, um, she had a bunch of credit cards and she maxed out on the credit cards and it just caused a lot of problems in our house. And so money was a huge issue. Uh, and my mother just died uh, and she was still having problems with money, even uh, on uh, the last few days of her life. But my father just would go off on her when it came to money. And there was a lot of chaos, a lot of verbal abuse in the house. And he would take it out on her and he would take it out on the kid. So uh, money is really a know how you would define it a touchy subject with me dating all the way back uh, to when i was a kid and it's funny because when you look at warren buff i'll contrast that with warren buffett uh, and i'm sure you know this already is warren buffett when he was a kid he uh you know was born in 1930 and by 1932 his father lost his job uh, and lost all of his money and it caused total chaos in the house. And uh, his mother started to have uh, mental health issues. 
and she would take out verbal abuse on him and his sister and call him worthless. And, uh, uh, he had problems with his mother his whole life. Um, and that, that was one of the, the things that really surprised me in writing the book that, hey, you know, I mean, he's Warren Buffett. He probably came from a really good background and had a lot of money and everything. But that, that just wasn't true. I mean, he went through a lot of hardship when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only the depression, but, you know, his mother. And that may have driven him to entrepreneurship. There was entrepreneurship in his family, you know, going back to when, when his family came over from France and were farmers. And then they came to Nebraska and they owned a grocery store. So he was surrounded with entrepreneurship his whole life. But, uh yeah, so he got into entrepreneurship and he was doing everything you can imagine uh, as a kid. Things that that I I was amazed to learn. Uh, he started at four years old with a lemonade stand on the neighbor's driveway uh, at four. Yeah, well, you know, and everybody knows the story about him selling coke and and uh, chewing gum door to door and golf ball, balls at the golf course, picking up tickets at the racetrack. Very Grammish, as mm -hmm. you uh, mentioned, uh, renting a Rolls Royce when he was in high school. My favorite is the pinball company uh -huh. that he started, uh, and he would purchase with this other guy. It was a, I think it was a, the Will Coin operated company or something like that, and uh, they ended up putting seven used pinball machines in barber shops, and they'd split the profits with the uh, with the owners of these shops. And, and to me, that was just really, and I have a story about that you can talk about later related to that. But yeah, so Buffett did all that and he, he didn't even want to go to college. He made so much money as a kid. He, he in, I, I think today's dollars, it was $76,000. He, he just didn't think college could teach him any more than what he was doing. He thought, you know, his experience in business was more important than going to college. But his father really pushed him towards going to UPenn, and he ended up at UPenn for a couple of years, and he didn't want to go there. He left there. I might be getting ahead of myself here. No, I, I, I love hearing it, and it's a nice uh, transition because I want to ask you about teaching. And a, a lot of people that are very successful, they enjoy writing about it, like you did, and then teaching at some point. I teach our interns. We have interns over the summer now and then, and I really enjoy that moment when the it just clicks. They understand what we do and how we buy stocks. And to me, the biggest revelation is that stocks are small pieces of businesses and they don't look at the stocks the same way starting from that point. So I'm curious about your experience teaching and your experience bringing students to Omaha to see Buffett. What's it like? Um, I'll go back just a little bit in relation to teaching. So I tried all these different things when I was um, in my twenties and, uh, I wasn't happy with anything. And I ended, I, I, I was making a lot of money that <laughs> this is the funny thing is I was making a lot of money at, at a fortune five company. I won't mention their name, but, uh, but I was miserable, you know, and my mom was telling me to make a lot of money, go make a lot of money. <laughs> and I realized at 23, that my mom didn't know what she was talking about, that money was not the answer. It's doing what you love. That's what the answer was. Uh, so I didn't listen to my mom anymore. And uh, uh, to make a long story short, uh, I ended up going into a PhD program uh, because I had a professor. If you're lucky enough to have a professor that cares about you, uh, you're very, very fortunate. And luckily I had a few in my life and this professor sat me down one day for about two or three hours and talked to me. He said, listen, Todd, you're an entrepreneur. You're not going to fit in anywhere. Have you ever thought about becoming a professor? And I said, no, I never thought about becoming a professor. Heck, I never even thought about getting an MBA. And by then I already had an MBA. And, uh, he goes, well, I think you should, because I think it fits your personality. And, uh, he goes, being a professor, you can do your own thing. Uh, you can do research on whatever you want, as long as it's related to your field. You can teach creatively and innovatively. 
Uh, and so he really made me think, and I thought about it for a few weeks and I thought, okay, well, what am I going to get my PhD in, you know, and, uh, uh, I had a business at the time that I was running while I was going to school full time. I just thought, I know entrepreneurship. I'm good at entrepreneurship. I'm making money as an entrepreneur. Uh, my dad was an entrepreneur. All my brothers are entrepreneurs. Uh, and I just thought, why not check that out? And, uh, there were only two schools that were offering a PhD in entrepreneurship at the time. One was Penn. And in today's dollars, it would have been a hundred grand a year. So that quickly didn't go the pen route and, uh, Georgia and Georgia wanted me to get in the top 10% of uh, the G and I, I wasn't in the top 10%, but I didn't see how that was related to being a successful entrepreneur. And I, I later talked to the guy that said that to me and he agreed with me that it shouldn't have had any base on me getting it at all, you know, um, so anyway, so I ended up going on and teaching. So the first time I stepped into a classroom, this is the, the teaching part. The first day I stepped into a classroom, I loved it. I found my calling at 29. It took 29 years for me to find it. And I just, it had nothing to do with money. It had to do with my, the way I, I felt internally and how I was helping other people. That was it, man. That was it. I found it. And ever since, you know what? That's the direction that I went. But I also loved investments. I haven't talked that much. Uh, when I was younger, I was involved in investments. Had an investment partnership with another friend. And we studied the Elliott Wave Theory. And our, our partnership kind of went up and down. Uh, and I also interviewed on the Chicago Mercantile for a job as a runner. But they were only going to pay me seven bucks an hour. So that didn't last very long, but I, I had always been involved in, in investment industry. It's fine, uh, fascinating to me. I love, uh, investments. I'm already getting excited here. Just talking about it with, you. um, I've never lost, I've managed my own portfolio my whole life. I think I went six months with somebody else managing my portfolio and I quickly back because they were losing money. Uh, so I've always managed my own money and, uh, uh, but teaching was, was great. I found my calling, uh, and, uh, I had a blast with it. So on to, you wanted to know about our trips to Omaha. I'd be that's, curious that's, to hear what's it oh, like. Oh, what a blast. Oh, I'll tell you. <laughs> I can only uh, imagine. It, 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 uh, being a professor is, uh, it can be very restrictive, uh, and, very political. Uh, and I always like to think outside of the box and be creative and innovative. And in 2007, my cousin, Steve Nog in Omaha uh, uh, called me and he goes, Hey, Todd, Warren's inviting, uh, universities to Omaha for a day. You should apply. And so, uh, I applied, you know, and it was just a one page letter. And I said, I had a nonprofit at the time. While I was teaching full time uh, with six other schools and we were doing some great stuff, you know, and, uh, so I talked about that and I said, Oh, I went to high school with your son. Uh, please invite me. Uh, uh, I got rejected right away. He's in here quite who at all because that's Warren Buffett, you know, Warren Buffett is you got to earn it. Uh -huh. You're not getting in here unless you do something that really stands out and. That's creative. And that's what I got from the, the rejection. So in 2007, we go into the great recession. I'm thinking, I still want to learn a lot about Warren Buffett. So I start, uh, uh, doing a case study on him. And over a two year period, uh, I wrote this case study, got it accepted. I had an academic journal. Then I had this epiphany that, Hey, what if I were to take this, this case study and send it to Warren Buffett and try and get invited again? Uh, why not? You know, and so I sent it to him and within 10 days, there was a letter in my mail, uh, from Warren Buffett and thanking me for writing such a nice case study about him. And he invited me to Omaha that year. That was in 2009. As a matter of fact, we came up that same weekend that he bought BNSF. Uh -huh. So all these, uh, photographers and cameras were following him around all day. Following us. 
but he didn't want to have anything to do with them. He wanted to focus on us because Warren Buffett loves teaching. Mm -hmm. He, he has said, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing, I'd be a teacher. So, uh, he loves it. You know, he, he just gets such a kick out of it. You know, and I, I remember being, um, there was something that really stood out our first time when we went to go visit him, uh, was, uh, I was sitting like right in front of him and he looked right at me as he's talking and he goes, he goes, the most successful business people that I've met in my life are people not with these, you know, fancy degree, he goes, but the people that have the most business experience that think way outside a box. I, I'll never forget that. Just because you have a fancy degree doesn't mean rat to Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. And he hires like that too. Um, so that was, you know, the first time that we went and then I ended up switching schools to Gonzaga and I got an endowed chair of the Pigott professor of entrepreneurship. And, uh, um, Gonzaga's a great school, great basketball school. Uh, they recruited me by taking me to a basketball game and I went there and I did the same thing to try and go see Warren Buffett again. And I wrote a one page letter and I got rejected again because I didn't really stand out. I just thought, why are you rejecting me? I was just thinking you like me. <laughs> and so this time what I did was, as I thought outside of the box again, I thought, well, I'm going to teach a class and half the grade is going to be dependent on them creating a new product with the oh. intention of getting invited uh, to go visit Warren Buffett. So this class did a, just a phenomenal job of creating these innovative and creative products. And the one, my favorite one was by a uh, religious stu studies major, an engineer and a uh, business student. They created a Warren Buffett pinball machine. <laughs> and what they were going to do uh, is go ahead and design it, redesign it for Warren Buffett. You know, and, and then send it to him. And I get to see Warren Buffett with that in his office, uh -huh. playing that when people are coming in to see him <laughs> and talk to him. Uh, it cost too much money, would have taken too much time. And uh, so we just sent the uh, application for a design of it. Anyway, long story short, we ended up getting accepted again. And so I took it. That was my second time that I went to Omaha. Uh, uh, and, and we went, we had a great time. Uh, and then there was another time that I took another class a couple of years later, uh, and we went and finally, you know, I'm kind of going along with this, uh, our, a member of our board of, uh, uh, trustees saw what was going on because this was all in the press and he wanted to meet with, me. and we went out to, to lunch and he, he said, Hey, uh, how would you like to fly to the shareholder meeting on my private jet? And I immediately said, yes, and he I'm not goes, surprised. Well, let's, <laughs> let's take, let's take six students with uh -huh. us. And so we did that uh, three years in a row oh, wow. and that was a blast. We, you know what those meetings are like and the people, we were standing basically all night long in line to get the best seat. And I used to run track in high school. And as soon as those doors opened up to the Pink Floyd money, uh -huh. I was on the fourth row and that was about as cl close as you could get. <laughs> at the shareholder meeting, I was down there. Uh -huh. My my uh, students always said, "Oh, think I never thought you had it in you." Todd, when I'm listening to you, I'm I'm curious. When you're teaching, I can tell that you're teaching persistence. You're, yes, you're teaching taking rejection for what it is, and it's not the end of the world. You create your own opportunity. You want to stand out. I really like that what you mentioned, and it comes across in this conversation in your book, standing out in the world where. There might be a lot of competition and then being thinking outside of the box. And I really like it because this example of you getting invitation for your students to see Buffett, I think it summarizes your approach to entrepreneurship as a philosophy. Am I right? You're, you're spot on, right on. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. And you touched on it, but I'm curious about the early days for Buffett because we all think that he discovered value investing when he picked up Ben Graham's book the intelligent investor. But you mentioned a story that I'd like to explore with you a little bit more. The racetrack discarded tickets that Buffett was picking up as a kid. Tell us more. What was it all about? And to me, it sounded just like something that Ben Graham would have taught him. 
he he was basically looking for things uh, that other people were discarding uh, and didn't realize the true value uh, that that was there. And and you know, occasionally he'd find something that people didn't realize there there was a couple dollars that was on that ticket, and he would go cash it, which is exactly what he was doing with Buffett or uh, Graham, you know, looking for these undervalued companies. Taking a couple puffs on them with, you know, with low PEs and uh, holding them and take a couple puffs. And he talked about that when we went to go visit him one year and he had a Moody's uh, manual out in front of him and he took out the Moody's manual and he started going through. This is like this 1950 Moody's manual. <laughs> He's <laughs> going through it page by page and he said, Oh, yeah. You can find a lot of good deals, you know, just by going through the pages, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, uh, he's pretty funny when he's doing things. He likes to be funny. You know, that's the thing that people, I don't know if they really realize that he's got a great sense of humor. Oh, I, I can tell. But you're touching on something interesting. So my impression is that Ben Graham was not really interested in the businesses. He would sometimes tell his analysts or people that are working for him, just show me the numbers of the numbers. Exactly. Makes Right. So he, he was very, yeah. he was a statistician. He was a statistical approach to investing. And I think he got burned, uh, obviously, in the Great Depression. And he was not interested in the product and the story. And obviously, the early Buffett was, in a way, very similar to that approach. And then there was a shift and an interest in what is the business all about. And that's where you come in and you can appreciate who are the people running it and are they real entrepreneurs? Will they make it a bigger success? And I think. Munger, Phil Fisher were an influence, turning Buffett in a whole different direction. Can you talk about that? I think it's a fascinating moment that took Buffett to a whole new dimension on all levels, intellectually and financially, and, and in terms of building a conglomerate that Berkshire is today. Yeah, Phil Fisher's book was great. It was just uh, Uncommon Stocks and can't remember the name of the book. It was remember the name of it? Common Stocks and Common Profits. <laughs> I always get that <laughs> screwed up. I, I love that book. It's a great, it's a great book. book. He was a genius. Just a genius. And, of course, Charlie's a genius. And they both led him down the path of, of buying good quality companies for the long term, uh, preferably undervalued. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if they're doing really well, uh, he has on occasion bought them when they weren't so undervalued. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the complete uh, change that, that I've seen. And this is the scuttlebutt. When he was younger in his partnership, he used scuttlebutt methodology as well. Collecting pieces of information and finding things that were undiscovered yet. What came across to me reading your book and, and being in Omaha this year and some of the questions that people were asking was an impression that there was no master plan, plan for Berkshire Hathaway. Obviously, Buffett took it over, and we can briefly talk about the fact that he bought it. He didn't want to buy the whole thing. He ended up buying a bigger share of the company because of a disagreement about the price. But there was no master plan that Berkshire Hathaway would become what it is today. Can you talk about that? Am I wrong about it? And it was more about showing up for the opportunity. Munger said it a few times, how the opportunities came and they followed, but they never knew they'll be bigger than GE, and GE was the company that was so big nobody could have imagined or dreamed of ever being bigger than GE. Yeah, I think uh, it's a combination of, of companies coming to him and him looking at the deals. Uh, Iskar was one of those out of Israel. That guy came to him with a one-page letter, and he loved it. Mm -hmm. um, and and him looking at, at companies sometimes over 10 years uh, and evaluating everything and and evaluating an industry, he's talked about this before, uh, and getting to know the industry, all the competitors within the industry, mm -hmm. and ask uh, people within the industry who they thought was the best, who they thought was the, uh, the worst, uh, and, and just becoming an expert and, and staying within this circle of competence. Mm -hmm. He was really good at that. I'm, I'm also curious about those moments when, and I wrote it down, the the retirements of Warren Buffett. There are moments that you describe also in your book where Buffett was almost done, or it looked like he was he was done. So in the mid-1950s, he was still very young, but he made enough money. You mentioned that even before going to college, he had more money than you would expect 
somebody of his age to have that kind of money. But by mid 1950s, he was he could have retired. He he had very limited needs. And then in the 1960s, he closed the partnership. It was kind of a second retirement. Can you talk about that? I think it's an interesting time for a lot of entrepreneurs that create a business, grow a business, sometimes even sell a business, and somehow they have to start something new. And he kept on starting something new. He uh, he made enough money when he was on Wall Street with Ben Graham for two years to retire. He became, I think he had $1.6 million in today's dollars. And he was just going to go home. He, he rented a house in Omaha. He had an opportunity to take over the partnership with some, some other guy, but he didn't want to be partners with anybody. He He's a true entrepreneur. Warren said when he was 10 years old, that he wanted to be his own boss. He did not want to work for anybody. Huh. 10 years old. I didn't even know what an entrepreneur was when I was 10 years old. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, so he had an opportunity to stay on Wall Street. He said no. Um, he went back to Omaha. He had two kids by this time. He rented a house for $175. And uh, he, he was just going to live off of his dividends, interest, capital gains, and he even said, this is funny, he said he was going to go to the college and take college courses. And you know how Buffett feels about college. Right. He, he, he's not, a, let's put it this way, nicely. He's not very impressed with college. <laughs> uh, he, he says you only need two classes to be a successful investor, how to value a company, and how uh, behavioral finance, basically, in, in financial markets. But yeah, so he's he's in Omaha uh, with his wife and two kids. He's chill. He's just gonna have do whatever he wants to do. He's made all this money, and and his family would not let him stop. They came to him and they said, "You're not stopping." Basically, they said, "You're too smart to right. stop, and we want you to manage our money." So his family. Uh, in his first partnership, they got together and they, they gave him a whole bunch of money. I don't know. It was like over $100,000. He only put $100 into Berkshire Hathaway, basically. That was his first partnership. He, he put 100 bucks into it. That was it. And that was the, the start of his uh, partnership years, which were, I think, 14 years and had an average rate of return of 36%. And... Uh, he gave that up because he said he was having a hard time uh, trying to make money in the markets back then because the markets weren't doing very well. And he, he said, uh, listen, you have a choice to the shareholders. Either take your money back or you can go ahead and reinvest it with me because he was he bought you know Berkshire Hathaway. So he gave them that choice. And um, I'm not sure exactly of how many people uh, stayed with him or how many people left, but the people that stayed with him are, are now building buildings in Omaha or uh, <laughs> buildings <their> <laughs> in, in Omaha. And, uh, on a side note, the health complex in Omaha is basically buff and it's just incredible uh -huh. to see what has happened in Omaha related to health. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so, uh, really that was, I wouldn't say that, you know, I mean, he tried to retire when he went away from Wall Street. But after that, I don't think he really tried to retire, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, he just went to a different mode. Mm -hmm. um, well, 1969, when he closed the partnerships, uh, it sounded, it felt like a moment, just uh, the way you mentioned, that he wasn't finding opportunity. And I think it was a good moment to, to pause. And then obviously the opportunities followed like they usually do in the market. And then Berkshire came Came at, well, he already owned Berkshire, but Berkshire became the vehicle to grow the wealth beyond the initial partnerships. When you really think about it, and I'm curious about your thoughts, but he hasn't been compensated really for his work <laughs> proportionately to the value added since 1969. What are your thoughts about? That's a great question. Well, supposedly he has 99% of his worth in Berkshire stock, right? Right. And, but he tells us, I have never sold a share of Berkshire stock, right? Uh-huh, true. So huh. Berkshire stock does not give a dividend. No. What are we missing? I don't know. You know more than I do. I I think I'm just projecting here. 
he's got to have some money, personal money, uh-huh. and, and he's reinvesting that, and we don't know about it because he doesn't have to di- divulge that. Mm-hmm. That would be my guess. You know, 1% of his wealth in personal money could still be a significant amount of money. I, 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 I'm not sure. What do you think? No, I th- I think it's fair. I always, I never really thought about it this way, but now hearing you say it, that should be the case because otherwise, if there's no dividend, the salary from Berkshire is very limited. I don't remember if it's a hundred or two hundred. And uh, where else would the money come from? I don't think he has a second job. <laughs> so he might have a small amount invested on, on the side that generates sufficient income. He, and He doesn't one, need a lot of money. No, no. House is paid for, car is paid for. He doesn't go on these fancy trips. Mm. Um, he lives a very simple life. Mm-hmm. You can live on 100000 in Omaha. Oh, I, I, in many places you, you can do just fine. Which brings me to another question that I had for you about entrepreneurship in general. And you say how entrepreneurs are hungry. And that's something you cannot teach students. You cannot teach them how to be hungry. Can you talk about that hunger? Because it's a really fascinating concept that people decide to get on this path of, we'll talk more about it, but risk-taking and uh, choosing a certain career instead of something that's much safer, you would think. Tell me more about that hunger. Where does it come from? How do you find it? How do you see it when you have students come into the room and to your class and join you? So motivation for entrepreneurs. I talk about this in the book. You know, I've got a section in the chat chapter one on what motivates entrepreneurs, uh, what the, the most successful entrepreneurs do. And I give examples of successful entrepreneurs. And one of my favorite is Jack Ma. <laughs> yeah, he, he failed getting into college three times. And then he, he tried to get into Harvard mm-hmm. 10 times. So he got rejected every time. Uh, he's a great, great story. You know, uh, you know, I don't know what's happening now over there in China because he had some problems with the government, but he's a great classic entrepreneur. And anyway, uh, is it something you're born with that, that kind of hunger? So what I, what I do on the first day, uh, when I teach entrepreneurship, I, I write on the board and I'm a terrible artist. It just kind of a square and I put a little, you know, button on the door and I say, okay, what is this? Everybody, nobody knows. Yeah. You know, that's a refrigerator. And then I open it up and I go, okay, everybody, what's in the refrigerator? And, uh, nobody knows. And maybe <laughs> one person, nothing, nothing is in the refrigerator. And this is what entrepreneurs are. They're hungry. There's nothing in their refrigerator. Uh huh. Uh, the entrepreneurs get it. You know, I look around the class. I see some people that are smart mm-hmm. and they it. They understand what I'm talking about. And by the end of class, the, those same people who are smiling are in my grill and wanting to learn as much as possible and telling me about their business they have already, or they're telling me, uh, about what they want to do and what ideas that they have. Entrepreneurs are rare. It's not like there's a lot of them that are doing. You know, in a class of 30, maybe there's a couple mm-hmm. that are coming up to me and doing that. I've always found that entrepreneurs are rare. You know, I don't know what the, the percentages are in research, everything. But also, there was an MIT study that was done on entrepreneurship. And they said 50% of people will at one time become an entrepreneur in their life, mm-hmm. which is kind of inter- interesting in, in, into itself. And I make sure I tell my students that, you know, because then that, that makes them wake up. Oh, hey, this might be important to me, you know, starting up entrepreneurs. I should pay attention. Uh, uh, yeah. And, but that doesn't mean that you can't be an entrepreneur. I just mean, that's just the first day and I'm trying to get a feel for who's motivated. And those people are people that what I've learned in being a, a professor of entrepreneurship is that those people, I leave them alone. They don't need my help. They're right. already on their path. They don't want anybody to get in the way. Mm-hmm. I will help them. I have a 70 member advisory board from all over the country and, and I'll help them. Usually they don't even need my help with that because they're already calling them mm-hmm. on their own. Uh, and 
that's the key for me with, with teaching uh, entrepreneurs, the best entrepreneurs, is to leave them alone. Oh, um, I like that. Uh, but, you know, the, the people that aren't as entrepreneurial, and I think all of us have some certain level of uh, creativity and risk take, uh, and that contributes to uh, being an entrepreneur. Everybody has a certain level of that, some more, some less. The thing that really gets me going is, is five years later, I have somebody that comes back to visit me and says, Dr. Finkel, I own my own business. You know, and, and thank you for it. And they'll say one sentence to me for saying this sentence five years ago. That. That's what really gets me going. And you had no clue. First of all, you had no clue that this guy would ever become an entrepreneur. Right. <laughs> and, and <of> all, <laughs> you had no clue that that one sentence had that big of an effect on somebody. That's the fun of being a, a professor and the fun of, of helping people um, and uh, exploring with them their potential, mm -hmm. uh, both internally and externally. I like what I'm hearing. I, I'm curious to explore a little bit more the downside, the mistakes, the, the risks. And Buffett and Munger share their mistakes. And obviously, as an entrepreneur, you get rejected, you make mistakes. And I'm curious about the bad decisions. And you mentioned how it's not greed that drives the world, but envy. Envy leads to bad decisions. That's what you're right. Can we talk about mistakes, bad decisions, both as an investor and entrepreneur? How can you get ahead with, uh, obviously, a number of mistakes that will happen on your path? I was listening to a uh, lecture with somebody, I can't remember, Monish Pabrai, I think was lecture and he was talking about good decisions that Berkshire Hathaway has made throughout their the life of the company and um, he according to him they've only made a great decision once every five years uh, and he says like half of their acquisitions uh, were just mediocre at right. best uh, and you know I haven't read that anywhere I just heard that from him Mm -hmm. And he, he's got the inside scoop with Charlie mm -hmm. and Warren. He talks to them all the time. Uh, so, you know, I can, I have a whole chapter on Buffett's mistakes. There's 21 of, of those mistakes. And I have a whole chapter on behavioral finance. And I tried to correlate both of those together into, okay, this is what Warren did wrong. What behavioral finance bias contributed to Warren's mistake? And so I try to combine those together. I haven't seen another book on Warren Buffett that has looked at a whole chapter on his mistakes. There might be some here and there, but that was one of the differentiating factors in my book from the other books. I tried to differentiate the book in other ways as well, uh, which is not so easy when there's all these books on Warren. Um, yeah, so you've got mistakes that he's made all the way back to when he was 21 and he had the gas station and it was a Sinclair gas station across the street. I think was a taxi. And that was a disaster. And he bought him and Charlie bought a, a, uh, department store in Baltimore. And that was a disaster. And, um, uh, you know, then they bought the biggest mistake was Berkshire Hathaway, of course. And Warren says that he lost a potential of like 400 to 500 billion dollars on that. Uh, and, and purchasing Berkshire Hathaway and, mm -hmm. and he kept it open. You know, he, he should have shut it down early, but Warren's got a soft heart for people. He doesn't want to hurt people and he left it open longer than he should. Um, and, and Dexter, that was another mistake that he made, uh, bought that for 433 million and that just basically bankrupt and 1900 people lost their job, uh, there. The thing, things that I think that are more interesting are mistakes of omission. Right. And, uh, he had an opportunity, uh, to buy the IPO of Google and they passed on. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they had an opportunity, of course, to buy Microsoft back in the eighties, uh, with Bill Gates and they passed on that. And Amazon right. had an opportunity to get into Amazon. I can't begin to tell you how many times I heard Warren Buffett say, Jeff Bezos is the best manager in the world. Yet he didn't own Amazon. 
that just didn't make any sense. Eventually, I, he did buy Amazon, but I don't think it was him. I think it was Todd Coombs or uh, Ted Weschler, one of his co-CIOs that bought it. You touched on something interesting, which is the human element. And some of the businesses like Dexter Shoes and Berkshire Hathaway itself, the original textile business went away. And I was reading in your book how he, you have a quote from his shareholder letter when he, well, when they had to let go all the people in a small town in Maine when Dexter Shoes went bust. Can you talk about that human element and uh, the soft spot that Buffett has for the people that he feels responsible for? And it's not just the shareholders, but also 300,000 plus people that work for all the Berkshire businesses these days? Yeah, I think I think that's a great question. Uh, and it shows his human side that he cares about people and he, he wants to help people. Uh, you know, uh, him not closing down Berkshire for so lost the company a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, but he says, I can replace the money, but I can't replace these people their jobs and they're so old that they it's hard for them to get retrained mm -hmm. and, and take care of themselves he's got a, a really soft uh, uh i don't know what the right word is he cares about people and another example i think more recently is the great recession he has all these companies i don't really think there was a lot of layoffs with his companies mm -hmm. uh, maybe sherwin williams might have laid off some people Uh, but uh, again, you know, he's trying not to do that with his employees because he cares about them. Uh, that's the human element of Warren Buffett. And I think that goes all the way back. I can, of course, to his child, but even when he got married to his first wife, Susie, I interviewed uh, Susie Buffett, the uh, daughter of Warren for the book. And she talked about how at dinner every night they would have a minority that was sitting at the table with them every night and how she really got Warren into caring about others uh, and making him more aware mm -hmm. of others because he was so focused on being a, an investor and everything. She was kind of his other half uh, and making him more aware of what's going on in the community and, and how he can help them and, She was supposed to be the one that was going to give away all of his money, uh, you know, and then she died of cancer. And, uh, you know, Warren Buffett is, would be the richest man in the world right now if he wouldn't have already given away all this money to all these different foundations. He's got like five foundations that he's got money. So you're touching on another interesting topic that I wanted to explore with you. So Buffett has interesting views about business, but also about inheritance and philanthropy. And you just mentioned how he possibly never sold a share of Berkshire since he bought it, but now he will be giving it all away. He has given quite a bit already away. Can you talk about his thoughts not leaving too much for the kids and then basically eventually you know, parting with all of it, especially after he's gone, it will be, I think, over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years sold off so that it can raise funds for all the different charities. Actually, was uh, at the meeting, I was surprised. I gave a talk um, at the Sino U.S. Uh, um, summit, and so a bunch of Chinese people. And Chinese people love Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. They <laughs> just loved him. And uh, there were there were two two Americans that were there. Me and this this lady. I didn't know who she was, you know. And um, so I introduced myself to her, and she said, "I'm I'm the head of Girls Inc." And uh, I don't know if you know who Carl Sink is. That that's one of the foundations that Buffett gives money to. Oh, And I wasn't okay. even aware. I, I I was just so impressed mm -hmm. that she was there and she was talking with me and she was telling stories about you know how Warren has given money to them. One was through a bet versus hedge funds uh, over a 10 year period, and he ended up giving them two two four million dollars because he won the bet. Uh, the S&P 500 versus uh, a fund of funds. And he bet that the S&P would beat the fund of funds over a 10-year period. And, of course, he won, and he gave it all to them. But that that's, yeah, one of the foundations. Most of the money that he's giving is is to the Gates Foundation. But he also has his, his three kids. Each have their own foundation. He initially gave them $2 billion. I think he gives them more money 
uh, to. And, and I believe from my talk with Susie that he manages their money. So he gives them money for their foundation and he also manages the money. So he's making more money, which I found pretty funny. Um, yeah. So he gives all this money and there's another foundation out in California that he gives money to, uh, geez, what was the name of that one? The, the money that went to that one was his lunch that he auctions off every year. Uh, and I, the name of it, it's to help poor people and people. I can't remember the name of it right offhand, but uh, I think he still does that every year. He auctions off a lunch. I think so. And, and Todd and Ted, I think both got their job by go buying that. Ted might have done it two years in a row. Mm -hmm. It's like three million dollars a year. Ted, Ted's done really well. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, he's going to give all of his money away. You know, he, I think. 10 years after he's gone, he said, all my money's gone. All my shares of Berkshire are going to be with all these uh, different foundations. Uh, he's not giving it to his kids. His kids just get enough to live on, but not too much to do anything. Uh, he, he's not a believer in giving his kids all that money. No, I'm sure that they're getting a salary with all their foundations. And but I don't know what that salary is. Mm -hmm. you know, Susie's so into helping people. Susie's into education. And she just got so excited when we were talking about, because I had a friend of mine that had one of her scholarships that she knew about, and she just got really giddy uh, when she heard that, you know, because she had a close association with somebody that helped uh, out their family. But she, she's great. You know, Peter does a lot with uh, women and all their social causes. And Howard, of course, is into farming. Does a lot with. So I have to, I have to ask you this. Once the shares of Berkshire are sold because of the different donations, there might not be a major shareholder like the one we have today that he jokes that he wakes up in the morning, he sees the major shareholder in the mirror and, and he's happy as long as, as long as that shareholder is happy. And as an investor, I know that something changes when you don't have the founder around and when you don't have some sort of majority shareholder that sets the tone. And in case of Berkshire, it's everything from not having options and stock-based compensation all the way to how they treat people and how kind, of, you know, how kind of business practices they have. But once you don't have a majority shareholder, do you think there's a concern that somebody could buy up enough shares and it might not be even a lot in some cases and start to push through a direction for the company that's not what it's been so far, including auctioning off some of the businesses and maybe inviting practices that Buffett would not approve of? Do you have some thoughts about that? That's a great question. Warren does, he, he wants everything to go smoothly after mm -hmm. he's gone. So he's got Howie. Howard, Howie, uh, as the, uh, chairman of the board of, trust, uh, of directors, he put Susie on there. I want to say a year and a half ago, so she's on the board of directors. Uh, he's got a uh, local investment manager, a new guy that he put on there, uh, Wally Whites. And, uh, he put on another, so this guy named Davis, uh, Davis or something. That's on the board of directors. So he's loading up his board of directors with, you know, people that he can trust. Um, the shares that he's giving away to the Gates Foundation, th this is where it gets a little complicated. Yeah, that's a good question that you ask. You know, what happens to the shares? They're going to have to sell them to get money for the foundation, right? You know, yeah. and how many, how many shares do the, foundations have who you know how many shares does novo foundation which is owned by peter or run mm -hmm. by peter and and susie and howard they have berkshire shares they all have berkshire shares uh versus all the money that he's giving to the to the gates foundation i'm just trying to think logically about this while i'm talking to you i'm thinking dividend uh, dividend um, dividend <laughs> uh, well, the two of us for a minute, let's think about it. If they started paying a dividend, even if it starts when, when he's gone, then the foundations get the cash flow 
and the dividend then might be substantial enough given the size of the donation that for a long time the foundations might not be forced to sell shares. That's that's a, a good guess. Right. And it makes sense. Because if you extrapolate that over a decade or two, eventually, otherwise, they will liquidate quite a bit of the holdings. And um, the makeup of the shareholder will, will change and evolve. And I think some ideas that these days Buffett can ignore because he owns so much of it will come up to the surface. And I've seen so many wonderful businesses eventually lose the f- original founder. And then different voices come in and they break up the company. They have different kinds of ideas. They want to use leverage. They want to borrow money. They want a special dividend. They want to do all kinds of things that are very short-term focused. And I've seen it too many times, especially if you have a quality business with nice cash flows. So it will be very tempting for a lot of, we call them activists these days, (laughs) people that come in and want to make a quick buck. And I hope there is some sort of a way to avoid it. I hope so too, uh, but that's a great question. Maybe somebody yeah. listening can tell us and, and email either you or me and let a- us know. Adam, what, what... You know. I'm friends with Adam Mead, and he talks about that in his book. I, you talk I, 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 I not about this aspect, but I'll have to ask him now that we are talking about it somehow. He doesn't, he doesn't think that that's going to happen. Who knows? There might be enough value investors holding on to Berkshire and willing to buy whatever shares become available that as a group that comes to Omaha every year, we might be enough (laughs) to perpetuate what Buffett created. But related to that, I have to ask you about something I read in your book, which I find really fascinating about smarter people than you. And you say how Buffett is comfortable and invites people that are smarter than him. And it's interesting because we see him as a business and investment genius. Yet he says that on so many occasions he wanted to have and was comfortable with smarter people than him in the room. And I think as an entrepreneur, it's very important to be comfortable with the fact that you might not know everything and you will have smarter people than you in the room. And I think our politicians would benefit from that advice sometimes too. <laughs> oh, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> but let's let's stick with yeah. businesses. Tell me more about it. I found it really interesting. And I think it's it's something that we can all tap into, that there are people smarter than us and it's worth listening to them. You know, there's there's it's it's kind of uh I I understand his thinking on this. Uh-huh. And I agree with it to a certain extent. And he, you know, he has done this. Tom Murphy is somebody that he loves, that he loved. He just passed away. Uh, he talks about him all the time. And of course, there's Charlie and there's his wife, although she may not have been smart from the financial side, from the other side of uh, the right side of your brain, the creative side of your brain. Um, and his father, you know, these are all people that, you might say that we're smarter than him in different ways. It doesn't have to be you know, financially. Um, Bill Gates, a friend of his, uh, Charlie, I already said Charlie, but I'm trying to think of all his little circle mm-hmm. of people that he surrounds himself with uh, and you know, how much that they have helped him. And this concept really has helped me as well. And I think it can help all of us. You know, you are who you roll with. Mm -hmm. Um, basically and uh, so for me it's changed me in the sense that do i really want to hang around this person if i don't feel about myself when i'm around this person no so why am i hanging around with this person um you want to hang around with people that are as i say to my students every year people that love you care about you want you to be successful and i continue to emphasize that throughout the semester. Warren just says, hang around with people that are smarter than you. I think it's more than that. Uh, Also, I think you have to be careful not to just hang around with people that are smarter than you and and forget about your friends. When you grew up as a kid, Mm -hmm. you still have friends that may not be, uh, you know, smarter than you when you're a kid, but you're a kid, you know, you're going to blow all them off. Uh, so there's some things that I question with that theory, but, uh, I try to do what he, what he says. And I think it's, it's important because you're moving in the direction of 
those people is what he says. Right. You're moving to a, to a, uh, uh, to a land that you're not on right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe that's a bad way of saying it. I, I think it's also hearing other perspectives and being open to other voices and other ideas. I mean, he could have stayed with his Ben Graham approach to investing throughout his life and eventually could have run out of ideas, especially with the capital he was managing. And here he was open to Phil Fisher, Charlie Munger, and even I think for the C. Scandi purchase alone that I believe was brought in by Munger, he learned a lot about appreciating the quality of the business, not just the statistical side of it and the people running it. And I think he allowed himself to change and grow, which is you know remarkable. And I think we can all learn from it. I have one last question with a quote from your book. And it's obviously Buffett's quote. Uh, you share how he said, I can't buy time, I can't buy love, but I can do anything else with money pretty much. And why do I get up every day and jump out of bed and I'm excited? It's because I love what I do and love the people I do it with. So I have to ask you about your own definition of success. What is it? Is it a destination, a journey? And how do you know you're on the right track as a uh, a professor, entrepreneur, investor, and, and you're in your personal life if you want to share. Um, this, uh, <laughs> I can go way back on that question. I, uh, one of the good parts about not starting to teach as a professor until later, your later years is that you've had so much experience and, and all the years that I was searching for something I didn't really know what it was. So what I brought to the classroom ever since I started teaching. Um, I emphasize the importance of internal happiness. So what I would do is I'd spend a whole day in class and uh, this is back and I started teaching the eighties, the, the early nineties, and we didn't have iPhones back then. So I had, I'd tell the, the whole class to pick out a sheet of paper and write down the word internal happiness on there uh, and then tell me what makes you internally happy. Eventually, I, that progressed into personal and professional you know, happiness. So uh, then, you know, I'd give them 10 minutes to try and figure it out, and most of them were done. And then we'd get into a big discussion about what internal happiness is. And, uh, and I'd learn quite a bit from, from the students. It wasn't just you know, like I knew everything, you know. I remember one of the earliest times that I did that was – there was this girl in my class that walked with a limp and she spoke up and said, uh, you know, happiness to me is my health. And I'll never forget that. It made me think, okay, I'm taking my health for granted here. Look at her and what she has to deal with every day. And ever since then, I've really talked about that to all my students, you know, every year about your health, the importance of your health. It, um, so, you know, gradually over the years, I've changed that to personal and professional happiness. And the kids will write it out and we'll get into a discussion and, and, and talk about it. And, uh, you know, personal is your, your family, uh, and your, your friends, um, helping people, things of that nature. Professional for them is getting a job. Uh, you know, a secure job and uh, doing something that I like, uh, living in a place that I want to live, uh, making a certain amount of money or financial security, things of that nature. But I, I would do it every year. And I, I now I don't do that exercise every year. What I do is I integrate it into the curriculum throughout the year. So I'll bring up concepts during the year and I'll talk about them throughout the class. This is part of uh, Ed Gonzaga. It's more of a humanistic uh, university. You know, we're, we're uh, trying to to teach this. You know, more than just information, how to be a better person. And so I integrate that through classes. Personally, for me, it's you know, family. You know, trying to uh, be the best husband that I can be, and I am a. Uh, I have a stepson in San Francisco. He's a baseball announcer for the San Francisco. And that's why I moved out to Gonzaga uh, to be closer to, but we didn't want to live in California. 
Um, so spending more time with him and going to, to the games and listening to him. Um, I really want to give back more. I'm nearing the end of my career and, uh, I've done well for myself and I want to give back in some way to a bigger cause, uh, than myself. And that will come probably within the next two to five years. And I kind of have a good idea of what I want to do. Um, uh, let's see what else. Professionally, there's not really that much love. I, I think the thing, this has been, you know, writing this book has really been exciting for me because it's like an entrance ticket to hang around with all these cool people uh, like you and um, Adam Mead and you know, Mario Gabelli and Rod, uh, Robert Hagstrom, all these people that I've been able to meet because of this book. It, it's kind of opened up a whole new world to me that I want to continue to meet new people in this world and to grow and to become a better investor. And the better investor that I can become and very similar to Warren, you know, the more money that other people will have that I can give to other causes and help them. So I don't know if I got everything as far as <laughs> what you wanted there, but no, I think it's a beautiful answer. I'm curious if you have another trip planned to Omaha with your students. Are you on the list or you oh, still have to? Oh, he quit. <laughs> he quit doing that because he, He's... he just, he, uh, yeah, he, he got, he's gotten too, too much. old. Uh huh. Yeah, he quit doing that, which is too. Yeah, I think my students, a... my students just love that. Uh -huh. You know, a lot of them, even from the first trip they have on their LinkedIn page, their picture with Warren Buffett because he took a picture uh -huh. with all of us. Wow. Individually with that first year. That's pretty special. Todd, I learned so much today. I really appreciate this hour and a bit that you spent with me, and I highly recommend the book, and I'll include all the details in the notes. And any, anybody that's curious to explore a different angle of Warren Buffett that we that I found in other books. So it's Warren Buffett, investor and entrepreneur. And uh, I really enjoyed the, this whole journey in the book from his early days and all the different ventures that he had and I, it made me appreciate a lot more various smaller lessons and bigger lessons in his life and how he has lived it by example and he never retired and he's not planning to despite some moments when I thought maybe he would have been done and but he continued so thank you for the book thank you for this time I really enjoyed it thank you for having me on I had a great time and good luck with your book and your podcast thank you so much you were listening to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest subject of all, money. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question, what it means to live a rich life beyond money. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment and follow, subscribe, rate, and share with friends and family. We rely on word of mouth to promote the show. One click for you means the world to us. Thank you. Until next time, your host, Bogomil Baranowski. The content of this podcast is for general informational purposes only, and so are the opinions of members of Seacard Associates, a registered investment advisor, and guests of the show. This podcast does not constitute a recommendation to buy or sell any specific security or financial instruments or provide investment advice or service. Past performance is not indicative of future results. More information on Seacard Associates is available in its Form ADV disclosure documents available at advisorinfo.sec.gov.